like to uh, thank Father Brendan uh, for the invitation uh, to speak here. Um, it's not often I get to speak in such a beautiful place and uh, with the lingering scent of incense, um, I kind of like that. I, I, uh, <clears throat> I hope it might ennoble um, my uh, presentation here, give it a, an authority it might not otherwise have. Um, I was uh, invited to, to say a few words about the um, theologian Hunters from Balthazar. Um, I have a presentation here. I'd like to um, keep it relatively short so that, um, if possible, uh, open up for questions at the end. I want to mention that now in case you want to think of a question, but uh, uh, this might not be ideal setting for questions and answers, but I'd, I'd like to give it a shot. So um, I'll open up at the end, uh, but please uh, uh, keep that in mind as I speak if something strikes you that you'd like to hear more about or raise a question about. <clears throat> Hansers von Balthasar is a, is a towering figure in 20th century Catholic theology. And as we all recognize, I think, there's something intimidating about a tower. Uh, it's tall, reaching uh, to heights beyond normal human uh, range, which uh, of course is part of the point of a tower. And it's, it's steep, it's not something that one can climb, at least not from the outside. <clears throat> On the other hand, if one does manage to uh, enter into the tower and get inside and find one's way to the top, um, one is rewarded by uh, a unique vista. Uh, one achieves the ability to see things in a new way. Um, one's relationship uh, changes um, not just to the tower, but in a certain sense um, to the whole world around. One gets an insight, a special kind of insight of where one is, um, what lies before and behind and about us. Um, so if Balthazar is a towering figure, he's also for many um, a, a beacon, a beacon of light. Uh, a reference point that can serve as a kind of a guide for us, for travelers from distant lands, you might say, or a light that can shine in, in the dark times in which we find ourselves. Um, so I think it's, it's useful to um, try to make the effort. As many of you know who have already begun to study Hunters from Balthazar, um, he's an especially difficult writer to uh, read, a uh, difficult thinker to enter into for, um, for many reasons. Um, what I would like to do here, it would be impossible to uh, explain everything about him uh, to, to, to get a, 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 um, a thorough sense of his theological mission. But what I would like to do is uh, at least uh, lay out some basic dimensions that I think make him distinctive among other uh, Catholic thinkers. Um, all uh, Catholic thinkers have a certain, have a mission to promote the church and the mission of the church, um, but each one does it in a distinctive way. And my hope is to sketch out at least some ways that, that Balthazar is distinctive. He was a prodigious writer. He wrote over uh, 85 books. He wrote over 500 articles. He um, received dictation for another uh, many scores of books from the mystic Adrian von Speyer. He did scores of translations. His, the amount of his work is, is, is absolutely overwhelming apparently a, uh, an uncle, a mischievous uncle at a family gathering of, of, among the Balthazars asked him if he thought he would ever find the time to read all of the books that he had written. Um, and it's, that's very intimidating in itself, but he's also a very difficult writer. He, uh, unlike some theologians, he tends not to have um, discrete 
succinct treatises on one subject or another. Um, Balthazar tends to lay out his own thoughts in conversation with um, the tradition in a way that I'll be explaining in, in a moment, but he, he tends to um, lay out his own views and discussions of the views of others, and uh, they, they tend to be scattered through his, his great um, ar array of texts. So uh, he's, he's a, a very difficult writer, it seems to me, to, um, to get, get a foothold into. Um, so the hope uh, of this uh, brief presentation is to try to um, make him a little less intimidating. Um, so what, what I'm going to do is um, <clears throat> lay out uh, five, what I take to be five marks that uh, distinguish his theological mission. And uh, these five uh, marks concern what I would call his theological style. Um, uh, rather than his theological content. Um, Balthazar himself makes a lot of this notion of style. He has um, a, a volume of, a couple of volumes of works on the theological style of various thinkers. Um, <clears throat> what I mean by style is the uniqueness of his approach to theology, the way he does theology that's distinctive in comparison to other thinkers. Um, one could also give a very interesting lecture, it seems to me, on, um, on the content, pulling out the very distinctive ideas that Balthazar proposes, his Christology, his interpretation of uh, the Mass, his um, uh, distinctive interpretation of the Trinity, um, his, uh, maybe one of his more controversial points, his sense of universal, uh, hope for universal salvation, a hope for universal salvation um, and so forth. Uh, there would be many interesting things there and that would be one, if you've been studying Balthazar and wish to raise a question at the end, um, you might uh, raise a question about uh, his ideas on one subject or another. Um, but what I want to do is focus not so much on those things, but again, on, on um, his style, his approach to theology, his manner of thinking. And as I said, I'll do that in five, uh, five basic steps here, <clears throat> five basic marks. So the first, <clears throat> the first mark is um, Balthazar's Catholicity. He is uh, very much a Catholic thinker in the etymological sense of the word Catholic. Catholon in Greek means according to the whole. Um, to use uh, categories introduced by uh, Soren Kierkegaard, the Danish uh, writer, um, uh, proposes a, a fundamental difference between the genius and the apostle. Um, um, Balthazar is much more like the apostle than the genius. The genius is one who um, uh, is absolutely new, comes with it comes up with absolutely novel ideas that no one can anticipate and speaks from his own individual insight, whereas the apostle is one who doesn't so much generate a new idea as bear witness to an inherited idea, bear witness to uh, a truth that exceeds him. Given these two categories, Balthazar is much more, as I said, like the apostle um, he bears witness to uh, a, a truth that is greater than himself, um, but in a way that's very different from Kierkegaard's uh, apostle, um, Balthazar uh, thinks in the, in the most basic sense in and with the church, and you might say at the same time in and for the world. What do I mean by that? Um, when, when Balthazar thinks through a particular theological idea, he uh, doesn't present this as his own idea. He attempts to, you might say, channel the whole tradition of the church. Um, it's one of the things that makes him so difficult to read, but he begins from the beginning, and you see this extraordinary, um, uh, 
extraordinary um, education um, uh, that he has. Um, he's able to draw on the whole tradition that precedes him and his own um, insight will come as the fruit of this great uh, tradition that precedes him. So <clears throat> you may, um, uh, he may focus on a particular thinker, um, but unlike some Catholic theologians today, uh, if he, for example, um, focuses on St. Augustine or on Thomas Aquinas, um, th there, there's sometimes a tendency to take those thinkers out of the tradition and, and uh, look at them simply in themselves. Balthazar will always read these particular figures as part of a tradition um, uh, in relation to the church as a whole and the Catholic tradition as a whole. And as I mentioned, it's, it's also in and, and for the world. He, draw, he, he thinks of the Catholic mission as, as, as being to the whole world. And the way that comes to expression in Balthazar's uh, own uh, writing is his really extraordinary capacity to draw on uh, uh, the, the culture, um, the intellectual history uh, uh, of, of the world. He um, is sometimes apologetic for not having had a, um, uh, an education and training in um, the Far East, the Far Eastern cultures, um, but the breadth of his engagement in the, in the, in the Western tradition, uh, his knowledge of the languages, um, uh, his, his knowledge of the, of the literatures produced in these various cultures, he, he draws on the whole of them in order to uh, give expression to the great truth of Christ that he thinks um, requires this enormous um, uh, breadth of, of, of culture and, and the, the creative traditions of, of man. Uh, to refer to Kierkegaard again, Kierkegaard once said a very beautiful phrase, it's one of my favorites, he says, to speak uh, about the truth properly, one needs to gesticulate with one's whole existence. Um, there's something really beautiful about that idea. Balthazar would say, to speak the truth, one must gesticulate with the whole world. Um, uh, and so he, he, he draws on all of it in his own thinking. I think that's a, a very distinctive mark of his theological style. So second, <clears throat> the, uh, the second mark of Balthazar's approach is the normative and foundational status that he gives specifically to the revealed Christian mysteries. Um, <clears throat> one might think with this reference to the, his enormous culture, um, he was called by Henri de Lubac, one of his friends, the most cultured man of his time. Um, that might suggest to you a certain urbanity and perhaps uh, a kind of ironic uh, disposition towards the faith that one often finds among the urbane. But uh, Balthazar was uh, was devoted to scripture. Uh, he was unapologetically uh, 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 founded his, th he was evangelical in that sense, founded his thinking on the gospel. Um, for Balthazar, um, <clears throat> scripture lies at the very uh, heart of his thinking and remains the normative measure in all that he writes about. Um, and so when he discusses theological ideas, uh, he does this within the tradition uh, of the church that has arisen on the foundation and from the source of scripture. So he does not, as, as some uh, thinkers might, um, take an extra ecclesial standpoint and uh, um, traffic in ideas in a kind of uh, free, freewheeling way. Instead, um, he takes his stand uh, not like a thief, um, but uh, through the shepherd, the, the gatekeeper. Um, he takes his stand in uh, Christ and 
specifically Christ uh, as he has um, revealed himself through scripture interpreted in the tradition. So these, these sorts of ideas I think will be familiar to anyone um, who studied theology. They, they're, they're basic Catholic principles, but I think that they are illustrated in a, in a really distinctive way in Balthazar. So let me give you an example. He's a radically um, Christocentric thinker. He begins with Christ at the center of things. Um, and he does so very much like a friend of his uh, 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 in Basel, a uh, sort of compatriot um, Protestant theologian, Karl Barth, who was known for having shaken up the Christian world by, by returning um, theological thought to Christ. Balthazar shared that with Karl Barth, but very differently from Barth. Barth saw uh, this Christocentrism as being in, in opposition to um, uh, worldly sources, um, natural reason, um, uh, philosophy, and the like. Balthazar instead saw these as um, coalescing, as having uh, uh, that, the, that the, the centering one's thought in Christ, in fact, opens one up to these other sources. Um, uh, so, for example, it's interesting if one were to compare um, Balthazar's interpretation of, of, of the mystery of the Trinity and the relationship between the Father, Son, and Spirit and the theological appropriation of that. If, if, if you were to compare uh, many theologians who, who work on the Trinity, they'll, they'll sometimes take something like the, um, one of the, the classic models to interpret the Trinity is what is called the, the, um, the psychological analogy that comes from St. Augustine. We think of the Father in relation to the Son and the Spirit as analogous to the mind and its powers of the intellect and the will. Um, and one can develop a, a whole theology on the, the Trinitarian mystery in terms of in the relations of the faculties of intellect and will. Um, Balthazar does not reject something like that, but what's interesting is he, he insists that to understand um, uh, even those dimensions properly, one needs to interpret them through the precise way that Christ revealed the Father and the Spirit in Scripture. One, one needs to start from Scripture and in, inside of the tradition, inside of the church, in order to, to uh, properly um, understand and, and deepen one's uh, appropriation of the Trinitarian mystery. Okay, so those, those are two so far. The third is that um, uh, Balthazar very um, uh, famously, I suppose one could say, um, gives a special and, and in a certain sense unheard of uh, significance to beauty. Beauty comes first in Balthazar's theological style. My father uh, once proposed that we might think of um, St. Augustine as the theologian of the good and Thomas Aquinas as the theologian of the true and then think of Hunters from Balthazar as the theologian of the beautiful. That puts Balthazar in very uh, elevated theological company. Um, but the point isn't so much to rank it. It's a po the point is to see something that's very distinctive in Balthazar. One of his central works uh, is referred to as the, the trilogy, um, but there are actually 15 volumes in the trilogy, 16 if you include the little post script volume, 100 pages that I have on authority he wrote in three days. Um, uh, this, in this trilogy, uh, there are seven volumes that think through theology on the basis of the beautiful, and then this middle five volumes thinking through theology on the basis of the good, and then three volumes on the true. Um, but it begins with, uh, with beauty. Now, why is that? 
<clears throat> it has to do with the previous point that I just made, the, the foundational significance of the central Christian mysteries as revealed. So uh, it begins with God's revelation of himself. For Balthazar, that's essentially an aesthetic category, manifestation, revelation, self-presentation. Um, for Balthazar, the reason that this is important to think of this as an aesthetic category is that uh, what, what comes first, in a certain sense, what sets, sets the stage, what's most important, what, what kind of opens uh, the whole uh, context for theology is not, first of all, what God teaches to us about himself. It's not even, first of all, what God does for us. So it's not first a matter of thought, not first a matter of action. The very first thing, which doesn't eliminate those at all, but the very first thing is simply what God shows us of himself, that God is great and he reveals who he is to us. And that's the glory of God, the manifestation of God. And that manifestation is what opens the possibility then for proper action and proper understanding. Now, uh, an aspect of this that is, I think, very helpful to see is, um, uh, comes when we reflect on how it is, what's the distinctive way that beauty engages us. I was reflecting on this as I was listening to the choir uh, moments ago. What an extraordinary gift uh, the Basilica has to have a choir of such, uh, such talent. Um, what is it that beauty, what is, what is our experience of beauty like? For Balthazar, um, uh, one of the most important things is uh, to see about beauty is the way it uh, engages us, um, lifts us up beyond ourselves. It sort of, it, it, it takes hold of us, seizes us and elevates us. And what's so interesting about that is that it is simultaneously something that's happening to us and something that we're doing. It engages us actively. So the um, uh, truth, our relationship to truth tends to be more passive. Something is true. If it's true, that's it, we receive it, we have to recognize it. It's something that we just simply acknowledge. And, and, and so it, in a certain sense, it's principally passive. Uh, goodness concerns action, and that's something that we do, that's principally active. We, we, we pursue the good, we, we, we uh, 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 choose, make choices and act on them. But beauty is distinctive, it seems to be simultaneously passive and active. It happens to us, but it involves our active participation. Um, we, we, we have to be involved to experience beauty properly. And what happens when we do? We're moved to, you might say, a higher level. And it's that being moved that involves our active participation that enables us to respond and enables us through our proper response to begin to understand. Um, this being moved, this is something that's really worth reflecting on beyond Balthazar, but just, just as a matter of one's own practice of the faith, I think, um, that there's something analogous to, in this, the, the, the being moved by beauty is analogous to faith, the act of faith. Uh, faith is something that we, um, uh, that is a gift. It's not something one just chooses. It's a gift, but it's a gift that requires one's assent and one, one uh, is elevated in the gift of faith. That's very similar to the way one is elevated in the experience of beauty. So that's the third distinctive mark. Uh, the fourth one is, uh, concerns the second part of the trilogy. 
Um, this is um, another notion that Balthazar is very famous for, and that is his notion of the theodrama. So the, the good and action. Balthazar conceives of this in, uh, as a drama. When God, what God reveals to us in his self-manifestation that is uh, glory and beauty, this uh, enraptured, this experience of, of being enraptured and taken up into God's self-revelation, what he reveals is not just a pretty picture. It is instead an action on our behalf, a deed of love, self-sacrificial love, uh, a, a deed that itself is so glorious, it lies beyond our ken. Now, if there is uh, a novelty in Balthazar, Balthazar's theology, something that really is new, for the most part, the things that seem new are just the tradition that we have forgotten. He's, as I said, very much a, 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 a conduit of the tradition. But if there is something really distinctively new in him, it seems to me it's his use of the categories of drama to understand our relationship to God. Um, he takes these categories from, again, this, this study of the world, the Western tradition, the great Western tradition from the Greeks through the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, and into the modern world. And he uh, uh, includes in this a, 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 a deep reflection on the very technical categories of drama, um, authorship, uh, playwright, staging, and what, what, what it, all of the elements that are involved in performing a drama. Balthazar uses those to help us understand the Christian life. Now, how does that work? <clears throat> um, he explains that when we experience God's self-revelation, which is a deed on our behalf, we don't properly receive it unless we respond in kind. God gives himself to us in this deed, and the proper reception of the deed is to respond by giving ourselves in action, by doing something. But this action is not just an arbitrary action. For, for Balthazar, our proper action uh, is something like playing a role in a play that, that has been assigned to us. We're given a part to play. And we have to, our, 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 our um, receiving that part, we, we conform ourselves to it. We have to, to, to grow into it in a way um, and, and appropriate and make it our own. Uh, for some people, this seems very restrictive, this idea that God has written a part for us. But Balthazar, uh, drawing again on, on the world's literature and the experience of drama, shows how you know, there are an infinite number of Hamlets. Uh, you, you see the play Hamlet, you can see, you can see it an infinite number of times. Um, every performance is going to be radically different because of the way the characters inhabit their roles and the interpretation they give and the, this creative work between the, not just the, the author and the director and the actor, but even the audience on a given night will somehow affect how one plays the part. And Christian existence is something like that. Um, we're given a part to play that has, in a certain sense, has been written beforehand, but the way we inhabit it and uh, the meaning it finally has requires our creative appropriation and interaction with others. So that's the, the third, or sorry, fourth um, mark, the theodrama, the sense of, of uh, our relationship to God being something of a drama. The, the, fin the final point um, that I think is distinctive about Balthazar's uh, theological uh, style is, um, uh, to put it in German first, I apologize, but the German just sounds nicely, das ganze im Fragment, uh, the whole in the part. It's a title of one of his books, but it's something that's very distinctive about his style. He sees uh, the whole expressed in each part. 
Um, so in this last part, I'm in a way going back to the initial reflection on Balthazar's Catholicity, his thinking according to the whole, but I want to um, highlight a different aspect of that here at the last part. Um, <clears throat> this, uh, this seeing the whole in the part, I think is, is, is a distinctive gift uh, in Balthazar's theological mission. Um, it's a gift, especially in uh, the contemporary setting. Um, it seems to me that we, one of the, the, one of the distinctive marks of uh, contemporary thinking, modern thinking, but especially contemporary thinking, is a kind of fragmentation. Um, we, we experience that in, in, uh, not only in the church, but in the world generally. We, we talk about this, um, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the polarities and oppositions and the, the, the binaries and so forth. Um, uh, it seems that so many aspects of our existence we see falling apart into opposing halves, the progressives and the traditionalists, um, the right and the left and so forth. Um, that that's, that's uh, uh, I think, a, a dominant experience of the contemporary world. Um, w one of the things that, that, that I think Balthazar can give us is a way to get beyond uh, the fragmentation, um, but in, in a manner that recognizes um, genuine diversity. So um, he's able to see the, the connection between things that seem to be opposed and to bring those oppositional aspects um, into relation to each other in a way that, that can be surprisingly fruitful. Um, so I'd like to give you a couple of examples, some, some well-known examples. Um, first of all, uh, there is a, a, an opposition, a sort of fragmentation of um, inside the church uh, between theology and spirituality. Um, theology, we think of something as intellectual and, and conceptual, dry propositions and so forth on the one hand, and this is for um, theology professors maybe in seminaries. Um, and then on the opposite side, we have uh, spirituality, which has to do with the heart and the affections in prayer and uh, the emotional um, and existential aspects. Um, <clears throat> and we, we tend to take for granted that these are just two separate things, but Balthazar presents um, uh, in relation to this particular opposition, um, what uh, has been called a, a kneeling theology, a theology on one's knees. He points out that in fact, one can't properly understand God theologically except with the help of prayer and, and inside of a genuine relation to God um, that is a lived relation. And on the other side, it's impossible properly to have a, 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 a spiritual life that is not informed by the substance of theology. It's not informed by, for example, the truth of who God is and the uh, treasures that theologians over the course of centuries have unfolded about the nature of God. That's something that deepens our spiritual life. It's not in opposition to it. Uh, so instead of this, this bifurcation, we have a unity. Similarly, Balthazar uh, shows the fruitful relationship between the intellect and the will. Um, these are often, again, uh, dimensions that are opposed to each other or fragmented, and, and, and Balthazar uh, sees them in unity. Um, uh, other examples are uh, theology and philosophy, faith and culture, tradition and progress. Um, but the, uh, the one that I'd like to end on that I think strikes a basic chord, um, to use that metaphor, or really cuts to the heart of Balthazar's theological mission is the 
uh, fragmentation, the dualism, separation of the church and the world. This is a theme that is coming up again uh, quite frequently in, in some uh, discussions within the church and reevaluations, for example, uh, reassessments of Vatican II. Um, <clears throat> I think it's a really fundamentally important, a crucial question. In this fragmentation that Balthazar describes, uh, we tend to relegate religion to the church. The church, uh, the members of the church, they're experts in religion, and that concerns the afterlife. That has something to do with our, uh, with the eschaton. Um, and that is set over and against the world. Uh, those in the world are um, responsible for the practical matters of life in this era, the temporal as opposed to the uh, eschatological. We have the secular as opposed to the religious. For Balthazar, <clears throat> um, that misunderstands the meaning of the incarnation. Um, this self-revelation of God in Christ, the incarnation of God in Christ, is not just a religious event. Uh, it's a disclosure of the fundamental meaning of things, the meaning of all of the things that make up uh, the, the essence of human existence, even in this world, here and now. Um, so that, that when the church uh, defends the truths of the faith, she's not just protecting religious ideas. By implication, in defending the truths of the faith, the, the church is actually uh, defending the truths of the world, um, defending the, the meaning of things in the world, so that the church uh, is vital to not just, again, to believers, but in a certain sense, vital to the world. <clears throat> to insist on that is not to ever to uh, neglect basic distinctions and differences and so forth, but uh, instead in recognizing the unity that precedes all difference, it enables the differences to be life-giving and in, in this relationship between the church and the world that Balthazar envisions, uh, theology has a task not just to seminarians, but has a task uh, uh, that concerns the meaning of life for all. So in a word, if the church has an ultimate mission, a mission of salvation and salvation of the world, it means that Christian existence is not in the first place about devising an exit strategy, uh, but the Christian mission generally is about filling all things with the spirit of Christ, gathering up the whole of the cosmos, all of history and culture, all of it, into the incarnation so that God might be all in all as the fathers of the church uh, often said, but as we in the modern world have often forgotten. So Balthazar's theological vision with its emphasis on gathering up the whole tradition, its centering on the Christian mysteries as God's self-disclosure, its beginning with beauty, its dramatic form, and its seeing the whole and the part Thus proves to be, I think, an exceptional sharer in this general Christian mis mission. Um, and in that sense, Balthazar, I think, presents us, represents uh, a Catholic theologian in every dimension of the word. And as a Catholic theologian in this, this robust sense, he is also a beacon of hope. Thank you. As I said, I'd like, I'd love to hear questions if anyone has a question. Um, if no one has a question, we, I won't keep you here, but please ask, yes.
Yeah, uh, yes. Um, not. It depends on what you mean, but he has a he has a very beautiful book on prayer, on the nature of prayer, and uh, reflection. So it's in that sense, it's it's there's something of a spirituality there. And he's also done some. It's interesting when I talk about his drawing on all sources. He um, rather than just engaging with theologians, he sees the the saints and mystics and uh, spiritual figures as revelations giving us insight into God. So he, in that sense, um, uh, he has, uh, he's got some beautiful books on, on, um, on various mystics too. But he didn't, um, Adrian von Speyer, his, his close uh, uh, collaborator, um, complained that he, she, she wanted him to do more of that. Uh, uh, and I think he, he acknowledged the truth of what he said, but I think he intended for that dimension to be expressed um, uh, implicitly in the way he was doing theology. Uh, yes, so, so uh, uh, that's a very interesting question. A cafeteria, Balthazarian? I like the expression. Um, I don't think it's possible. I, 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 but I mean, that's, I think that's true for all real thinkers. Um, if you end up taking little bits and not the whole, it usually means that you're not even understanding those bits properly. Um, I, I, I think that uh, Balthazar's ecclesiology, his interpretation of Mary and so forth, uh, can't really be divorced finally from his interpretation of the Trinity. Um, now, I, you know, uh, it would be fun to discuss, to hear your objections to uh, uh, the, the Trinity, um, his interpretation of the Trinity, which is a very distinctive, as I mentioned earlier, distinctive part of his uh, thought. I think it gets mischaracterized um, in, in, uh, in some discussions and um, the way that he's interpreted warrants objections. But I think uh, that um, there's, there's more to it than uh, is often recognized. Yeah, I, it's, it's, you know, could, can one be a, a cafeteria Thomist? Or a cap, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know. But but the, the key is always um, to see the, the to 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 not to make the theologian the object of one's faith, but the the church and the tradition of the church, and to, to see the theologians as um, illuminating this common tradition. Um, I think that's a really important point. But uh, thank you for the question. <laughs> that that's a good question. I, I yeah, I um, they're hard to purchase, and and some of them, I think uh, Father Fessio, who founded, I, may, you you may or may not know Father Fessio, the the uh, one who founded Ignatius Press. Um, anyone who reads any Catholic literature knows Ignatius Press. Uh, um, he basically founded the press in order to. Um, translate and make available the works of Balthazar um, de Lubac and Ratzinger and Adrian von Speyer too. That was the purpose of the press. It has since grown quite beyond that, but that remains um, central to it. I think that's helpful to know. Um, 
but he was in a bit of a rush in the beginning and I, I, I've, I've always wondered when they're going to come out with new editions of the trilogy because there are typos, um, some missing, uh, sometimes missing footnotes and so forth. It's, it's a shame. They, those need to be redone. Yes, that, that's uh, an, an, another point of some controversy. She, she is quite an extraordinary uh, person, overwhelming. I, I find when I read her things and read about her, um, uh, I find it she, she's, she's too much. <laughs> I, 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 I find her almost frightening in her, um, um, uh, the, the, the extent of her, um, the charisms that she, that she received. Um, that kind of experience, I think, is common for some people, and they will often, especially in academic contexts, will try to separate Balthazar from Adrian von Speyer. Um, but uh, I think it's very important not to do that. Um, Balthazar himself, it's, it's interesting, He's, he always said that his own theological work was third on the list of importance of the things that he did. Um, the first importance he gave to um, this uh, community of St. John, uh, 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 what's called a secular institute, a, a, a consecrated uh, community um, that he founded along with Adrian von Speyer. Um, the point of which in a way is to overcome church world division in a really profound, his, his theology of sec secular institutes is, is uh, one of the most interesting dimensions of his thought. He, he really took the work of the, of the um, community to be of central importance. And then second, he said, was the, the Adrian von Speyer's work, that his, his own work was, was at the service of, of, of uh, allowing her to be better known and to show that things that she said that might sound um, extreme actually represent something that was part part of the tradition of the church that's been lost to, to try to give a, a kind of a um, apologetic for her and then third is his own theological work this small third thing that involves 85 volumes and <laughs> and uh, mountains of uh, essays and so forth but i yeah so i think it's it's uh it's crucial not to separate them Yes. Your estimation, what aspect of this work was the church most in need of now? Did you have a mark of style or content? Yeah. And given the valuation of the church? That's a, that's a really interesting question. And I know when I'm driving home tonight, I'll, I'll regret I'll, I'll think of something better uh, th that I should have said. Um, uh, this is just kind of an immediate react response, but I, I think that I might say um, his ecclesiology, um, the 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 uh, uh, his the way that he understands the very nature of the church in relation to Christ and the incarnation on the one hand, but then in a way that I think it is especially important now, um, the relationship between what he calls the Marian dimension and the Petrine dimension. Um, how it is that in a certain sense, Mary represents the whole church. And in another respect, Peter represents the whole church. And uh, we have to recognize simultaneously the depth of the, you might say, the spirituality the, um, the, the, and the lay dimension of the church that extends out into the world. But to recognize that without losing the crucial significance of office and institution and, um, as we were talking earlier today, the, the juridical and the official dimension, all of that is actually crucially important. Um, we t as a, as I was saying earlier, we tend to oppose those things and think of them as having nothing to do with each other. But I think a, a, a deep appropriation of the 
Catholic tradition sees the unity between those. And that, that's, I think, something especially with the, the kinds of, you know, with the progressivism and traditionalism, these kinds of fragmentations that have become so normal in the church, um, that's something that would be a really important thing to receive from him. But as I said, I'll, I'll send an email tomorrow and I'll tell you what I really should have said to your question as I reflect longer on it. Yes. Yeah, you know, that is, so uh, the one that, um, that f first opened me up to Balthazar is the one that I think has generated the most controversy, which is his book, um, Dare We Hope That All Men Be Saved. Um, and the reason I, I for, now I, I don't know that I would recommend that to everyone, but, but, um, uh, uh, I said it's controversial, but he, he's, he's often thought of as a universalist. And, and when you read the book, you realize he's not a universalist in any kind of banal sense. Um, uh, oddly, my experience of reading that book was simultaneously, I felt more hopeful for the salvation of all, simultaneous with far more terrified about my own. <laughs> uh, I mean, the, the, um, uh, so, so there was no, no sort of facile, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's an extraordinary thing. Um, and it seems to me there's something really Catholic about that, that there's, you don't take any of it for granted. Um, and yet the greatness of God's love can open you up to the whole. That, that was something that just um, uh, uh, struck me. Um, there's a, a book, uh, a little book that gives you a good overview of, of uh, sort of a synthetic presentation of many of the points, in fact, that I made tonight um, that's uh, called uh, Love Alone is Credible. Um, so that's one of the most succinct uh, books. It's a little book where he kind of says the whole thing. The problem with that is it's very dense. It's not an easy read, but, it's, but it is a very succinct one. Um, apart from that, it, you know, it depends on what you're interested in. He has books on some saints. Um, I, I think typically when people ask me for book recommendations, I, it always depends on what you have an appetite for, what your interests are, because um, uh, he's got quite a few, quite a few options. So, thank you. Thank you all.